fiveanddimeeastin.com. They have their website officially up. You can shop most of their stuff online. They also uh, they also have fucked. They have fucked in the store. I think they're the only one allowed to sell fucked out of their store. Uh, it's 484-544-4719. That's at Five and Dime Easton on social media. These guys are great. I mean, they're killing it. It's the best skate shop, in my opinion, in the area. They have a lot of cool stuff there. Both the owners are rad. I stop in when I can. Uh, they're open Monday through Friday. Friday, 11 to 7, Saturday, 10 to 7, and Sunday, 11 to 5. There is someone always there to help you out with your needs. You can check their inventory off the website. You can check out some videos they got on there, and they're doing some cool things. Their social media is awesome. They support a lot of local skaters in the area, and they're growing. I'm excited to be a part of them growing. I'm excited to help them out. They're helping me out. It's a good relationship, and I push Five and Dime Easton because they're the best skate shop in the area. Check them out. B. TG Blasting, my man, Pat Cunningham, offering you pressure washing, disinfecting, acid washing, and rust removal. It is a high pressure washing business, bringing your stuff back to glory. He does anything from houses all the way to having him come into the studio. He comes down to the studio on a schedule and he disinfects the studio and we are certifiably clean and you, it just covers all the bases. So with the things that are going on now, you're going to be you're going to need somebody like this. He's got a sticker out front. I am certifiably clean down here. He also offers free estimates on all your needs. He can do corporate and at home. You can reach him at 484-241-1711 and btgblasting at gmail.com. He just started this business and it is taking off. I'm super excited for him and I'm super excited that he's a sponsor of the show. And you can check out BTG Blasting on social media for all of your presser washing, disinfecting, acid wash, and rust removal needs. It's high pressure washing, bringing your stuff back to glory. He offers many things and you need to check him out. Eric K. Dowdle, defense attorney. We had him on the show and what crazy stories this guy's had. He's helped a ton of people over the years and uh, if you're looking for help he is your guy you can contact them at 610-882-3000 and it's ekdefense.com uh, do you have a pending court case? Do you have a court appearance and need a defense lawyer? Do you need proper representation? Felony misdemeanor, drug offense, assault, homicide, DUI, traffic violation, appeals. Reach out to Eric. Check out the podcast we did with him as well. It has his whole whole story on there. If you need help, Eric is here to help you. He sponsors the show. We appreciate it. He's going to be doing a monthly thing with us. Eric will be a part of the family now. Thank you for sponsoring. Like that, it hangs in the back of my head, and I'm like, Jesus Christ. And then so I, I make sure everything goes. And even now that I look, it's still panicked. Um, welcome to Never Again Radio. Uh, my, well, our friend George, I just met George through the 10th Planet guys recently, uh, maybe last year, year or two. Uh, one of my favorite people, he's come down for the fights. I love George, and he hit me up and was like, I got this guy, you got to try him out. And he's like, I'm down the road, I'll come down right now. And I'm like, I'm not at the studio. And um, we went from there, I came and had your food. I was blown away by it. Uh, I'm not just saying that, I'm impressed by what you do. Uh, and then you came down and you've leveled up my podcast by being the first person to do a full cooking segment down here. Um, I want to get into all this. Uh, you made two dishes for us. What were the dishes that you made? Uh, we made uh, a cacio e pepe, uh, which we are going to be introducing at the restaurant as of next week. And uh, I also made a Sofia Loren pasta dish, which is our number one selling dish. And you're laughing you, because you love it. Yeah. When I, if I'm excited for food, I, I just laugh. Uh, uh, when I'm impressed by food, it's usually like I just giggle like a child. Um, and when you were making that, I was excited because I had it at your restaurant. And that dish is outstanding. Is that why there's no more left back there? There is a little <laughs> bit left. I'm saving it for the Seven Sirens because he came on the live video and was like, save me some. But uh, I want other people to have it. Um, but it is the type of thing that I would hide in the fridge and tell them there's none left and then eat it alone. Oh, you're bad boy. <laughs> uh, how long have you been cooking for? Uh, since I was a kid. I would say 13, 14. You know, I was always behind my mom. You know, looking at what she was doing, mom, grandma, everyone cooking in the family. So I always had an interest, and then, um, you know, I grew into it. So here I am now. What kind of things would you cook growing up? Were you just helping out, or would they just Traditional be? Traditional dishes, you know, 
you know, homemade desserts. Um, I mean, pretty much a little bit of everything, but I, I really have those great memories in my head where back in the village, all the ladies from the neighborhood will come together and uh, they will bring, let's say, their tomatoes and they will make this huge pot. I don't even know if they make this size pots anymore. Huge size pot with like wooden fire underneath and they will like take sauces and put them in like mason jars and like preserve them for the winter and stuff. Like those were the things that always amazed me. Like, you know, how people get together around food and that's the magic of food. And is that primarily how you grew up doing the food and like you always would kind of make it with family yeah i mean food is uh, something that brings family together um <clears throat> everyone uh, keeps their mouth shut while they're eating and that is a great thing so <laughs> that means that they're enjoying it because if they're not they're gonna be nagging they're gonna be saying something um and uh yeah i mean i love i love hosting um i love having people around me and you know cooking like i, I literally can cook for an army um, and I won't even try anything just because I see everyone enjoying it. That's my thing. I love it. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I could tell when I met you, um, that you enjoyed the entire, you, like you love cooking and the whole presenting. And even when you came down here, um, I, I've worked in kitchens over years. Uh, and then for someone to come down here and just set up and was like, cool, we're doing this. Like you had complete confidence. There wasn't any lack of like, Hey, I mean, we kind of didn't even know what we were doing at that point as far as what we were going to get in for content, but you already knew exactly what you were going to do. You brought all your different dishes. Like you came prepared and it was awesome. Um, but the other thing that I've noticed, and now that you're talking about growing up with family and all that is, um, I try and tell people like the mood you are in and, and, what you put into the food as far as like love and care and like, you know, like I don't, I'm giggling because there's something that you did to that food and it's, you put emotion into it. And now that you're explaining about the cooking in large groups and the family background that you have, it's obvious that why your food is tasting different than other people's is because of what you're actually putting into it, which is care. And you give a shit about cooking. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, if you don't do something with passion, you don't do it right. No, not uh, at all. That's my motto. Um, we uh, we also make sure that the ingredients that we use uh, at the restaurant and in general, I mean, in my life, you know, with, for my kids and uh, family, whatever I cook, I always try to, you know, source quality products. Um, that makes a big difference. And also having a little bit of knowledge on what to do, how to do it, you know, add the extra care, like you said, um, that always elevates things. Um, when I had, <clears throat> I mean, when you overfed me, um, when I came to the restaurant, but everything I had, it wasn't like you were just saying that it was quality ingredients. It wasn't like you were just saying, Hey, I use fresh stuff, you know, like my flour is different for the pizza. Like once, and if you know food and know the difference between somebody just making something and then somebody cooking with the better ingredients, it's night and day. It changes the dish completely. Like if you made that, uh, the shrimp dish with stuff from a dip, you know what I mean? It, w it wouldn't be the same. The reason that tastes good is because of the quality and whatnot. Um, when did you start, I mean, is that just how you grew up with just using fresh ingredients and, you know, cause some people will cut corners and I always tell everyone you can't cut corners with food. Um, but the simple fact that you're not cutting any corners, like where does that come from? Is it just how you were brought up with cooking or just how you decide to do things because it is something you do at home? So, I mean, when you grow up and you have, you know, in your backyard, fresh produce and when you want to make a salad. You go grab your tomatoes and, you know, your cucumbers, your peppers, your onions, and you make that salad. And then you use, let's say, your uncle's extra virgin olive oil. Um, and then you try to make a salad by buying stuff from, you know, a lower quality source, either a supermarket or whatever. You can, you can taste the difference. Uh, the difference is there. Um, now, I come from a place where the cuisine is known for using a lot of fresh ingredients. Like uh, the whole uh, cuisine concept uh, back in Greece, it's all about you know fresh ingredients. So I grew up with this idea. And um, this is what we are doing at the restaurant. We are very selective on what we uh, you know choose. We believe in uh, clean ingredients uh, and real food. That's our motto. That's, you know, as soon as you walk into the restaurant, there's a huge wall with that on it. Clean ingredients, real food. That's... Uh, what would do a patch and uh, people has uh, been appreciating that um, they can tell that we use fresh ingredients and that is actually a very good thing because I 
I interact with people that they know their food buds, like they know what to look for. So they come to me because of a specific reason. And, uh, you know, that gives me courage and, you know, I want to keep going. <clears throat> were you cooking um, before you got into Pat's? What were you doing? Were you cooking? Well, um, I was doing a little bit of everything. Um, I was uh, working for my father back home. Um, there was a little bit of cooking and a little bit of uh, serving involved on what I was doing to help him. Um, I served the army and then, you know, basically I came in the States. So since I came in the States, I've been in the restaurants. Yeah. Solely. Yeah. Um, when did you decide that you wanted to, <clears throat> I mean, cause I cooked for a really long time. Um, and you know, I'm sure anyone who gets into cooking and loves it, they always talk about, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to open a place, open a place. You know, you always hear that in the kitchen and whatnot. When did it, when did like, what was the reason that you wanted to get into your own, your own restaurant and kind of, you know, cause it's not an easy task to tackle. Most people kind of shy away from doing it, but like what drew you to opening your own, your own thing? Um, so it was, um, some sort of, uh, a challenge, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I was talking with my partner and, uh, we wanted to uh, explore a different area because uh, my background for the past 20 years has been uh, down in uh, the state of Delaware uh, and the surrounding areas. And uh, we looked into uh, Lehigh Valley and uh, we both decided that we wanted to do something a little bit different than you know your typical pizzeria. And uh, <clears throat> we worked hard, really hard to come up with a menu um, and you know find the right ingredients and the right ambience and we just did something completely different than we're used to and uh that is a great thing for me basically because you know i keep challenging myself and trying to make better uh because i see the difference like uh there is no and i think i mentioned that to you when you came in the restaurant there is no food that we open up a bag and we cook like we put in a deep fryer and this and that we have mozzarella sticks and french fries but you have to have those um, even our chicken tenders, they're homemade. Yeah, the, I forgot about the chicken tenders. Those are so good. But it, like, that's the difference I'm talking about, though, is that you could buy, and I've worked in restaurants, you can buy uh, chicken fingers and you can deep fry them. And then I even worked at places where they're like, hey, we should turn that into a sandwich. And it'd be like, that's an okay sandwich, but it, like, if you take the chicken, you'd bread it, you take the extra time and then build that into a sandwich, yeah, it tastes better, but then some people don't want to put in that work. And then it takes a different type of person who's like, no, the work is worth it. It's going to taste way better. And then that's going to be what we're known for. And like that, that chicken, like I don't eat chicken tenders a lot, like because it's just bagged commercial nonsense. But I would eat that chicken tender every time it was in front of me. Or you could take that and turn it into a cutlet and make a sandwich with it. It's like there's more to do with it because you're making it from scratch as opposed to if you're just getting it out of a bag and it's freezer burnt or it sits in there too long because nobody's ordering it um i just hats off to you for just doing what you're supposed to do everyone else you know what i mean like there's so many restaurants and things that just will buy a bag of chicken tenders and that's fine but to me that's not what you're supposed to do well again there's great chicken tenders out there ready to go into a fryer like really good quality yeah. and they taste good and stuff but then if you read the ingredient list of what they're made of, there is like those really long words. I don't know how to pronounce them, sorry. So if I cannot pronounce them, I don't understand how my stomach is gonna be able to digest them. Uh, we use five ingredients for the breading process. And you know, they're all like great ingredients, a little bit of paprika, salt, pepper, uh, garlic, and our panko breading, and that's it. And uh, they're amazing. So, um, we, we do a lot of things from scratch, uh, and they do take time, and they do cost a lot more. People would think, oh, he makes it himself. It's costing him less. No, it's not. It's costing more, and there is so much more to actually uh, be aware of uh, when you work with uh, poultry. I mean, you know, you have to have, like, certain temperatures and times and this and that. So the educational level, the training that we provide to, you know, the people that work with us, uh, it's very professional. Uh, we have to make them understand what they're doing, why they're doing it, um, and how to do it, you know, in an effective way where you know, time and quality is always there. So yeah, that is what we do. What was your menu like when you guys were first putting it together? Because I know that's kind of a fun stage 
where you want to build, you know, you take in the creative ideas and you're kind of seeing what you would want to be on the menu. And you're like, all right, we should do pizza. We should do this. We should do that. And then <clears throat> when you came up with that idea, then what was it? Breaking everything down and being like, okay, we're going to use this ingredients for that. We're going to do everything from scratch. Like kind of, kind of take me along the journey of when it was a general idea of what's going to be on the menu as to what it is now. So, okay. Um, I will tell you what we have on the other locations menu, for example, and, uh, how much we uh, you know transformed that, and you know we we did something completely different. For example, um, at the other locations, at the other restaurants that I've been involved in in the past, um, we've had a cheesesteak category on our menu. There was like nine items there: your buffalo chicken, your chicken cheesesteak, your regular, your pizza steak, your blah blah blah. Hot sandwiches, where you know you got your veal parm, your chicken parm, your um, club sandwiches six or seven items, wrap sandwiches, you know, another night. I said, you know what? I want one category of sandwiches, and I want those sandwiches to be really good. Yeah. So we did a category of sandwiches. We have uh, nine items, and, I mean, they all sell equally, believe it or not. They all sell equally. Uh, we just added a Beyond Burger, uh, the ba the, the plant-based uh, yeah. burger. Um, it's not for everyone. Um, it's... Uh, it's growing in the food industry. That is the only seller that is not doing great, but I have high faith in it because uh, I bought some of their stocks too, so they better do well. <laughs> um, then, you know, same thing with uh, pizzas. Uh, we had like four different sizes at the other locations. And I said, no, I want the sizes to be two. And I want to have like your typical toppings, but I want all the toppings to be high-end toppings. So we are using an imported soppressata, for example, an all-natural pepperoni. Uh, we use artichokes. Uh, I mean, we have fancy um, and healthy toppings for a pizza that make us stand out a little bit. I introduced you to uh, my pasta guy while I was cooking. Um, I mean, we buy high-quality pasta. I'm not selling uh, spaghetti with four meatballs, a side salad, and bread for eleven ninety nine. No, I'm never going to do that. I'm, I'm out of this. I used to be there. I'm out of this. I sell quality stuff. And it comes solo. You want a spaghetti with marinara? That's it. It's not going to come with, you know, a bunch of other items. You come here for the good pasta, you eat the good pasta, you enjoy it. You want to have a side salad, you know, you order another salad. We use organic mix for a salad, for example. We don't do your typical... I forgot about uh, the salad. The salad yeah. was so good, too. <laughs> uh, well, you, had, you had the one with the arugula and the yeah. pizza thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, our typical mix for the salad is like an organic mix. Uh, you know, we don't do the iceberg lettuce, for example. I mean, I, I forget when was the last time I had iceberg lettuce in my life. Why would I serve that in my restaurant if it's not something that I like personally? You know what I mean? And there's nothing wrong with the iceberg, but I think it's more of like, you know, an ingredient for a salad making uh, 20 years ago. You know, cuts down the cost, ups the way. You know, you grab a salad, it's like three pounds, and you're like, oh, I got that for $6. Well, no, well, no. get some organic spring mix there. You know, get get your good toppings. Uh, and our salads are fairly cheap, like 6 and $9, depending on the size you get. Um, but everything is carefully selected. So, you know, our pizza is amazing. We use imported tomatoes uh, for the sauce. Um, the flour, I believe I went, um, I went over that with you. Yeah. Uh, it's unbleached and unbromated. Um, very, very important. Uh, potassium bromate is a carcinogenic ingredient. A lot of people don't know it. A lot of people don't even know that it's in the flour mix of 90% of the flour mixes in the, you know, in the nation. But... Uh, we choose not to, you know, buy this kind of product. So we differentiate ourselves, like I said, uh, from uh, other pizza shops that are doing a great thing, you know, and uh, I love competition, but, you know, I just try to be on a different level of experience for my guests, let me put it this way. Um, it was one of the first things I noticed when... You brought the food out, especially with the pizza, because the pizza is awesome. And the, the the valley has so much different pizza here. There's good pizza. There's shitty pizza. Like you know what I mean. Like there's, oh, even this town has 19 pizza places. Um, but I go and I get food, and I I love food, and I've had really good pizza, and I've had pizza that gets 
the the higher end toppings and it completely changes the pizza altogether because um I had stuff with a, a pepperoni and it was one of my first time with like how it like cups up and I was like oh man I'm used to like just the bag stuff somebody's throwing on top of it and then when I saw when you brought out the pizza I was like oh man like he's not messing around with these ingredients you're spending the time and you're spending the extra money to make your product taste 10 times better and it wasn't like hey we just do it for the pizza like you're doing it with every single item because the first thing you brought out I believe was the salad and I was like man like this is fresh it's good it had the beets I, what what was it uh, goat, goat cheese, cheese yeah. yeah but even the goat cheese I was just like it was like melting in my mouth. Then I then I went over to I think then the chicken fingers and then I was like, "Holy shit, he's making these from scratch." And then there was like an aioli thing with it and I was just like, "I know food enough and I don't know everything about food, but I know enough that you care and you're spending more time on making this 10 times better than a normal average run-of-the-mill restaurant." It was a uh, I was impressed with everything that you brought out because then you brought out the meatball and then I was like, oh my God, like I remember posting pictures and everyone's like, did you eat all that? And I'm like, I took half of it home, but it wasn't everything hit home. And I think it's such a better idea to do that than to overload yourself with a menu of just way too much shit. It helps out in the kitchen. Yes, it's more work for the guys who got to make it, but they only have to know nine sandwiches which is way better when the tickets are backed up and someone's like oh man i gotta make this we never make it go grab the stuff that nobody ever buys you know what i mean like when you have it dialed in like that and it's 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 a a simple menu it's awesome ingredients and there's less to choose from it's usually a way better restaurant than when you got a nine page novel of like everything they do from breakfast to lunch to dinner what i'm getting at is like when you when you did your sandwich breakdown and you only chose like to do the eight or nine sandwiches. What, what was the reasoning behind, or not the reasoning, but like what, what made those be the ones that stayed? So, okay. Um, uh, everyone can appreciate a good cheesesteak, for example, right? I said, I want to make a cheesesteak that I'll be proud of that. It, it will be a lot of people's favorite sandwich. So, how do we go about it? You know, what kind of bread are we using? Um, what kind of steak meat are we using? And what kind of cheese are we using? And we're using your typical American cheese, cheese whiz. So you know what? I want something sharp. So we're using sharp provolone for our cheese. So steak. good. Yeah. We do an application of the garlic aioli on the bread. The bread is a, a very nice baguette. It's an actual baguette. It's not your typical and, you know, Nothing wrong with the uh, Amorosos and, uh, you know, Licious Breads. I've worked with these companies. They got some good products. But when when you want to do something different, you know, you have to leave the scene of everyone else is using this bread. So uh, we we literally cook the bread per order, the, the baguette. Um, then we make our own bread, a uh, focaccia bread, where we make uh, some uh, other sandwiches, like, the meatball sandwich, for example, okay, we came up with a really, really good meatball recipe. So now, how do we make a great meatball sandwich? And I remember myself having meatball sandwiches back in the day, left and right in restaurants. There were meatballs that, you know, would come in a bag, already cooked, people would warm them up, toss some sauce, put them on the bread, and then melt a little bit of purple and cheese and serve it. They would give me the heartburns, like literally. After I ate it, oh my God. Well, I took my meatball and I said, what are you going to pair well with? So fresh mozzarella is one and we're using a high quality cheese, Um, a kale pesto, homemade kale pesto sauce, a little bit of garlic aioli and arugula on my homemade bread. I mean, it doesn't get better than that. You got to try the meatball sandwich next time you actually come to the restaurant. Um, So again, I, I looked at high sellers. And I tried to basically make them as I would like them for myself and how I would serve them in my house. Uh, And then we did, we cover some areas uh, with some uh, grilled chicken type of sandwiches uh, that we uh, catered on uh, from the other uh, locations. Um, And, you know, we got two burgers on, I mean, like, you know, we don't do like five different kind of burgers. We do two burgers and we do them well. I use a good uh, ground beef 
and you know, I do brioche, brioche bread, and that's basically what you want. Um, so if everyone comes in as a party uh, at a restaurant, and you know, someone is not into the pasta, yeah, there is a sandwich option. There is a simple option. You know, you want to get burger, get a burger. Um, I love the size of our menu for a lot of reasons. You named a few earlier when you were talking. Uh, one is the cross utilization of all the ingredients. Nothing stays unused for more than a day, literally. Like everything that we use, I have someone in there at six o'clock in the morning every day doing prep. My menu is constructed in a way where it's 75% prep, 25% execution. It's so simple for the guys in the kitchen to actually make every ticket that prints out of those printers. And I can tell the difference because I used to be in a clusterfuck, excuse my friend, situation back in the day with all these items. And you will get like 20 <laughs> different tickets and there will be like 35 different items on those 20 tickets. No good. Now you get 20 tickets and there's seven different items because the menu is so short. Um, and that helps out a lot. Um, well, I mean, I was going to segue. Uh, coming from cooking and working in restaurants where they're not ran correctly like that, like it is a nightmare. It is a nightmare. I worked at a place and they had uh, like a bunch of different burgers. And like one burger would have, you know, like an onion ring and barbecue sauce and this and that. And then it's like now it's taking you know, three minutes to find the ingredients. And then it's like, if you're in the weeds and you're trying to get out of them and then you got a burger and you know that burger is going to take six minutes to set up before it even goes on the grill because you got nine things from the deep fryer coming on top of it. It's like, it's an unrealistic way to work. And I, I don't think a lot of people pay attention to the people that are actually cooking. And if those people can execute their job in a fashion where they can get stuff done and they're appreciative of you who's making their job easier, you have a really well-oiled kitchen, which most people don't pay attention to having like that. Correct. That is correct. The, the smaller, the better when it comes to uh, doing volume, especially. I mean, think about a Friday night where you process, you know, sometimes about 80, 90 tickets an hour. And each ticket, you know, might have anywhere from one ingredient, I mean, one item to, you know, 13 items. Imagine, you know, how difficult it will be if you actually do have a six-page menu. I mean, it's 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 no good. Then Especially you got, training new people? Yeah, and then oh you got a time, like, you know, a, a station <laughs> might have, like, a, let's say, an order of mozzarella, yeah. stuff, which gets made in two minutes, yep. and then that, that, that same order has, like, another 17 items that will take a good 15 to 20 minutes to be made. Well, guess what? The guy over there just wants to get the mozzarella stick out of the way. He puts it down, you know, it, he backs it up, and then yeah, the time then you, the order yeah. gets back, the thing is cold. My ticket's like, done. No. I'm done with yeah. this whole thing. No good, no good. I'm avoiding that. Um, I'm really proud of how the menu uh, came to be. Um, I uh, I wanted to add a few things on the menu, um, but not in a way where, you know, okay, you started with a small menu, and now why are you adding more? I mean, you're not a believer of that anymore. Uh, yes, I still am. I'm, I'm trying to add some uh, new pizzas. Because it's always good to have like a good selection of pizza. I mean, we are a pizza restaurant. Um, people have been coming in for three years. They've, they've tried all my pizzas. I've got, I've got customers that try all of my pizzas. You know, I want to introduce something new. Uh, so we're doing, uh, we're launching as of, uh, when is it uh, that we're shooting the, the food? May 3rd. Um, I think that's next week already. Yeah. May 3rd, we're going to be doing the, you know, the digital for uh, the social media platforms and, uh, you know, our website. Uh, and we'll be launching everything um, a week, a week to 10 days after that. So we're introducing some new pizzas, uh, some new pastas uh, as a limited time offer just to see, you know, how people react to it. And uh, whatever sells well, you know, might just stick around on my menu. Um, I'm just never going to, like, add so much where now I'm a hypocrite on what I just said. Like, I hate six-page menus. I will never do that. Maybe do another concept where we do just pasta. You know, that, that would be great. Or we just do pizza, takeout pizza, and you get like 20 pizzas on your menu. But that's all you do. There's, there's amazing things that you can do nowadays as long as you're doing them well. If you do good, you'll do good. So if 
your product is uh, good, people appreciate it. So I'm a strong believer. Your pizza is a uh, is a lot different than, uh, as I said before, the other ones around here. Um, what made you want to step the pizza up and kind of change the flour out and do uh, the different things with the the better ingredients? Is that just something that uh, you wanted to do because you like a better version, you know, that style of pizza, or is it just something that you wanted to find a kind of a different niche in the area to do something different with pizza that other people are not? Because your pizza is very unique. Uh, I mean, the way it's presented, um, I noticed the difference in the the dough and the the crust on it. You know what I mean? You can tell the difference in what you're doing. What made you want to even go to tackle that? Because I'm sure there's a lot of places that just put out pizza and you can still make money on pizza. So that was my biggest nightmare. Uh, the decision about going to a Roman style pizza and going to a brick oven. I've never worked with a brick oven before in my life until this concept. Uh, I've always been, you know, working with uh, rotating conveyor belt ovens, you know, uh, typical pizza on a pan. Uh, recipe for success. I mean, that's the majority of the pizzeria world right now. But uh, I said I want to I want to do something better. And when I want to do something better, we're talking like I want to do brick oven pizza. I want to do an artisan type of pizza. So I had to do a lot of research. When I say a lot of research, I mean you have no idea how many batches of dough we went through. Well, until- that's what I was going to ask you is if you were. You know, was that a style of pizza that you were enjoying and eating? And then you're like, man, like, I'd like to recreate this. You know what I mean? Was it something that you were traveling for and were like, man, like this, I think this would work in what I'm doing? Well, um, I wanted to have a product that will travel well because, you know, we do deliver too and we do take out uh, and not to focus on uh, Napolitan style type of pizza that it's best if it's been eaten like as soon as you know it comes out of the oven because this thing is like really you know thin and it becomes chewy after it gets cold and all that uh, doesn't reheat well so I, I needed to get between the you know the thick type of crust and the thin kind of crust um, and someone one day told me you know let's let's go to that place try this place out and we really enjoyed it um then the crust had to be you know tested out like i said we did over 20 different kind of batches and it's a waste but you know we didn't like it throw the dough away you know, we didn't like it throw the dough away um and then we had to uh you know play with the tomatoes a little bit how do we go about tomatoes simplicity like real simple stuff um three ingredients in our tomatoes salt pepper garlic that's it but if you get a good tomato you know it's a home run uh, same thing with uh you know our crust we don't add like i've seen people adding sugar molasses uh conditioners oil in their dough formula water salt yeast that's it you just gotta find the right hydration level <clears throat> and let your uh, dough ferment for the right amount of time and then have it sit on a certain type of room temperature before you actually cook it there there is a whole science around it and uh, i've learned a lot the past like few years around the dough um <clears throat> i've been making uh bagels for like the past i don't know six months i never got into baking um i reached out to a couple of my friends uh like my friend angelo who makes pizza and um i never realized like when you cook and like the dishes you made today, like there's there's ways that you can create flavor and change the dish and you could do a lot with that. With baking, it is such a science that like you have a general formula you have to use, but then changing the taste is what you were saying, like in the room temperature times, like the last batch of bagels we had, um, we boiled them when the dough was cold. And we didn't know what that was going to do. Well, that made a totally different bagel than when the bagel rose and was room temperature. And then when we did that, it expanded more. It lasted longer. Um, It's pretty impressive how all that stuff actually works and that you actually figured out what you figured out because it is not an easy task. That is extremely time consuming, waiting for all that stuff. I mean, how did that how long did that entire process take? Because, I mean, at this point, were you like. Did you have the restaurant already and you guys no, had to no. do this or you were kind of playing around with this? This was all 
pre-gaming before you even got into it. The, the test kits and uh, time frame uh, we went through was uh, <laughs> uh, a solid six months. But, you know, it was like, okay, let's try this. Let's take notes. Then let's talk about it after, you know, we leave the kitchen. And I like that, but I did not like that. And I mean, thank God it's over, but it was very, very educational. It's a lot of work. A lot of work, yes, a lot of work. And uh, I've learned things that I did not know, not proud for the fact that I did not know them, uh, but I'm proud that I know them now, uh, and I've better myself. Like, for example, you know, you can't take cold dough and put it in an oven. It's going to blister. Yeah. You know, um, but what did we know so far? You know, take it, sauce it, scissor it, put it in the oven, you know, it comes out of the other side. Uh, and that was the simplicity of, like, conveyor belt ovens. Now you do the brick oven, and you gotta you gotta be very careful how the product enters, how the product rotates. When it comes out, you don't put it in a box or on a cutting board right away. You gotta let it cool off for like thirty seconds. All that 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 oven heat that it's on the bottom of the pizza, you know, you put it on a cooling, you put the pizza on a cooling rack right before you cut it, so it maintains the crispiness. 30 seconds after you pull the pizza out of the oven makes so much difference on a pizza. The next time you come to the restaurant, I'll show you that. It's like an additional yeah, stuff. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to, my I'd love to just check it. the kitchen out. My cooks hate it, but you know what? If it's not done, a pizza is going to get soggy. Once it gets boxed, 10, 15 minutes later, it's a soggy product. I worked at a place, and they did uh, they did heavy volume burgers, and then you made the burgers from scratch and everything, and... Uh, the big thing that the chef pushed was like, I don't care how far back the tickets are. You have to let these burgers rest for 30. You know what I mean? Like you got like it tastes what they want. And that taste is because we let the burgers rest. And it was, you know, that's it's hard sometimes when you got 50 tickets and you just want to get stuff out of your way. But letting things sit and doing those little tricks really changes food completely. Believe it or not, there's restaurants that they actually have a rest area. Like yeah. you see on the highways, it makes sense. Though. Yeah, yeah, you, you got to do things right. If you don't, if you start cutting corners, uh, you know, then you have inconsistency issues. And yeah, inconsistency is what can actually break a restaurant. Absolutely, I tell people all the time with uh, cutting corners yeah. with food. I said you just can't do it. I said you you can't even if you did it for feeding your family and you cut corners, it just, it's not the same. And it's usually the downfall of when the business starts to take hits is because you don't realize the magnitude of like, okay, well, now the food's going out differently. So now it's going to take a while for everyone to realize that your food's not the same. Now you now you got people that are starting to cut corners and becoming lazy, and then now they start doing it with other habits and things inside the kitchen. And before you know it, it's a shit show. So um, I came across a lot of times um, on a preparation course, uh, people will be like, uh, hey, Yanni, I figured out if we do this this way, it's uh, a little, you know, less time consuming you know i'm not opposed into looking into you know what did you come up with like how do you you know how do you do that and let me see the steps and then let me see the product you know let me box the product let it sit for 30 minutes then i'll try it uh, if i see absolute no difference then you know what all right you know we'll go ahead and do it that way there's two things to point out with that. One, I love the fact that you're open to listening to other people because there's sometimes where people are too prideful to be like, no, that's my way. There's no better way of doing this. And I, I, I've worked with people that were open to things. And then even I had a guy who was com way more qualified as a chef than I would. You know, I've always just been a line cook. I never call myself a chef or anything. And he would even say to me, be like, I'm going to show you how to do it this way. And if you develop something that you think is going to be faster or better, show me, and then maybe we could learn. But if it's not going to be, we'll just do it my way. And I, the moment that guy told that to me, it was just a totally different attitude in the kitchen than someone being like, this is what we have to do. The other thing I want to point out is the fact that you go through the entire process, including going in through the takeout, which is, you know what I mean? Like you have to do that stuff. Mm -hmm. Even with me making smash burgers and stuff that I want to do for pop-ups, I'll wrap them up like I'm giving them to someone. I'll let them sit, and then I'll be like, okay, how are these going to be in an hour? 
How are these gonna? That's why, like, right now, I'm giving bagels out to people. And then I brought bagels down to my friends, and the bagel was different. And I was like, okay, what's the shelf life on these? Like, you really got to go through all the steps of receiving it in order to get a truly perfect product or what you want to present to people. You know, if you didn't take those steps and it was, uh, hey, we'll do it this way, and then somebody gets a burger and you get a phone call, and then now people are saying, like, oh, awesome pizza, but don't order that. It sucks for takeout. And that stuff happens. Like, very good example of today's uh, actual cooking, right? Uh, Cacio e pepe. Uh, it's a great type of pasta, but you have to eat it when it's done, when it's served to you. If you let that sit, it kind of bonds a little weird. And that is one thing that I'm not sure if I'm going to be serving for takeout, for example. It might just be something for dining purposes only. Same thing with the... Uh, Try and I think you tried the uh, gazoncelli uh, last time you were at the restaurant. Yeah, well, you know, a really nice kind of pasta stuffed with uh, speck, mortadella, and prosciutto. I love speck. Oh my god, this this pasta is so good. Um, in the same kind of like thinness of the pasta that you smashed back there. Uh, <laughs> That's so good. <laughs> and uh, we make that in a creamy gorgonzola sauce. Oof. I mean, yes, but you know, when it gets a little colder i'm not gonna say cold because we don't we don't deliver cold food don't get me wrong okay uh our presentation for like packaging purposes it's like top notch it we really is when i took the the pizza home i was impressed in the box and how you guys mm -hmm. do everything yeah. uh it's it's no joke what you're doing over there um and I, I would highly encourage every restaurant that will ever hear this podcast you know to up their game on the packaging guys the takeout business is what is gonna be like up your game like get rid of the styrofoam containers please it's no good, no healthy. Um, so that, that guy's on chili pasta, for example, um, it's definitely something that I will not serve for delivery purposes because, you know, the creamy gorgonzola sauce, after, you know, it goes off temperature, it, it becomes like a paste and it bonds everything together. And it will be embarrassing for someone to open up a container with like, you know, condensed pasta. Like and then if you're serving that to somebody who doesn't understand food and then they're going to blast you on Yelp and then you're, you know what I mean? Like, like there's a, so much I love about what you're doing. One is that you are not afraid to tell people no. There are so many people that let the customer control how they run a restaurant, what they put on the menu. It, like I've worked at places where we were only open because a couple guys came every Monday and got food, but we they were losing money. And I'd be like, why are we open today? Because Ted and Phil want food? Like, is that what we're basing this whole day around? And there's places that, that will let, Everybody else have the power. And that's why I like pop-ups. That's why I like having limited things. That's why I, when I do something, I'm not going to open my doors because I, I, I got sick of the general public telling people like restaurant owners and educated people like yourself what you're supposed to do. I like that you're not serving those dishes because all it would be is a bunch of people who don't understand food complaining about your food and giving you a bad name because you were forced to do takeout like that. I think more people should do that. If your food isn't going to be the way it's supposed to be, do not give it as takeout. Mm -hmm. it, it just, it's just, it, it should be controlled more by the owners. And I feel like the, most restaurants are bullied too much. Well, yeah, and most restaurants basically have the mentality of, well, since I have it available, why not make it available for you know delivery as well? Uh, it, it all depends how much you want to you know do damage control or, or damage of exposure to yourself because if you really if you really are on the other side, the customer side, and you're receiving that, and you pay $19 for it, and when you open it up, you're not really happy, would you do it? Like, you know, if you're on the receiving end of this? Uh, and that's what I always do. I put myself on the receiving end. I get I get the restaurant to deliver it to my house. Don't get me wrong. So, you know, the other day I had them deliver some of those new dishes. Just so I can see how, you know, they will look up on delivery. It came in about 30 minutes. Um, we're really fast with deliveries. I mean, we, we try to get the food out of the door 20 minutes max. 20 minutes, to me, it's considered a late order. Uh, so the customer will have it 25, 30 minutes. Um, the food came. It was nice and warm. But uh, I wasn't feeling it. I'm like, mm, this, this might not do a good takeout. It will make a killing in the dining room, but it will not do a great takeout. Now, if you're a customer that had that dish in the restaurant and you want to call yourself a takeout for that day, 
Yanni, I'll be coming over. I want to pick up an order of uh, cacio e pepe. You know, I'll make it for you. But I'm not going to put it on the menu as a takeout option. So, you know, buy at your own risk. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, but it's smart. It's smart doing that because there's a lot of people that would just be like, I mean, even even let's say let's say I didn't know you or anything and I ordered that dish and I got it back and it wasn't the way the dish is supposed to be. And then I was just like, all right, that was all right. You know, I, I don't need I don't need to get any more food from them. I don't need to go in there. I don't need to try the experience. I'm solely judging you off of one pasta dish that because of the time that it took to get here, it wasn't the way it's supposed to be as if it was brought to your table. You're going to lose a customer who potentially would have came in because coming into the place, it looks it, it's awesome. It's got a great vibe to it. Um, it's, it's a totally different atmosphere than getting takeout. You know what I mean? Like you would want to go in for the experience. Like Merson, I tell everybody, I'm like, their food's awesome. It's awesome to go in there. Your interaction with him is what you're, you know, it's what the experience is. So it's like, uh, I don't know, man. It's like, why would you want to lose somebody who could potentially be a friend who comes in all the time? And it's just like, man, I love this place. This is where we come on Friday nights. And that was screwed up because you just wanted to put everything on takeout because, well, it's here. Let's just serve it. And I don't think enough people pay attention to that stuff. Yeah. Like I said, you know, exposure control, that's, that's all about it. And you know, uh, bottom line is that, uh, mistakes are going to happen. You know, people are going to get either the wrong stuff or, you know, not made as it should, you know, the, we're all humans when there is a rush and you know someone is overwhelmed or is not having a good day you know mistakes will happen things will happen uh you have to have the type of mentality like i said being on the receiving end put yourself into the most difficult persons like personality wise uh position where you know they just spend some money and they're not happy with what they got and just make sure that that person loves you at the end of that phone call. And even though they got, you know, a not great kind of meal, the way you handle the situation, um, either you fix it on the spot, you know, you do something down the road, um, you make that person feel that has been taken care of. Um, customer service is something that, you know, nowadays we're all lacking. That times change, you know, uh, and customer service is something that uh, we strongly advise our staff to always provide. Most of my reviews, uh, if you look on Google, um, they talk about how nice the employees were, you know, how kind and helpful and all that. So we do focus on customer service a lot. That's number one. That's important as well. Um, <clears throat> there's nothing better than going somewhere and you're taken care of and then there's awesome food. It makes you want to come back and then it becomes a destination spot and then that's where your go-to is. And then, it's, you know, then you become friends with the people who go there and um, it just makes the all-around experience better. Now, when you have your menu, you guys do your six months, you got it together. Um, what was it like for you to open, you know, day one and be ready to go? And, you know, how was Bethlehem to, to open in? And, you know, what, what was the whole process to open your doors? Well, we, uh, we did a very, very organized soft opening week where we had sessions um, like lunch sessions and dinner sessions by invitation only um, just to see how the new – because the, the whole menu was new to me too. I did not. And the brick oven. And the brick oven. I mean, and all the people that I work with, other than two managers that came to help me out that I've, I've, I've had previous experience with, were all new to me as well. So I was trying to help all ends of the aspect, like dining room, kitchen, answering phones, taking orders. Um, the first three months... I uh, I don't ever recall myself being that busy and working so many hours, like continuously seven days a week, and going there at 6 o'clock in the morning every day and leaving at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, sometimes 12 o'clock. Um, it was crazy, but, you know, doing it over and over and over, um, I started feeling a little more comfortable because I was... I was panicked. 
all right, having to deal with a new menu, a bunch of new people, uh, and new customers in a new area, I'm like, man, I'm getting, you know, whipped from all over the place. But then I, I started feeling a little better. And of course, I'm, I'm not supposed to be the one that shows how I feel because if I show everyone that, you know, I'm a parent, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. you know, not a good leader, you know? Uh, so I kept my cool, you know, I put my hours in, I grinded, and, uh, you know, here we are today. Um, I feel very confident about what we do, what we make. Um, I can work in, you know, any spot with my kitchen whenever I'm needed, I'm there. I can flip the dough and do other stuff right now with a brick oven that I wasn't familiar with, and I love it. I really do. Um, and, you know, I'm just there on a daily basis, keep doing my thing and trying to better myself and promote the restaurant and do it as organically as possible through social media. Um, you know, we're here today. We are promoting uh, some new dishes and we're having a nice chat and I really appreciate that. Yeah, man. Uh, I mean, I, that's what I created this platform for was to kind of just, you know, get into uh, who people are. And, um, you know, I've always grown up with food. I've worked in food and there's always so many special people that don't really get highlighted in the kitchen because they're working. And I also think it's remarkable that, you know, you put in the hours and you work and when you're in there working with the staff, you know, like what you said, you, 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 you hide those emotions of being scared and whatnot, but it's like that pays off because they're looking to you to lead the ship and they're trusting you to, uh, you know, be the one that's in control. Like, Hey man, like he's got it. You know, if it gets busy, it's like, okay guys, we're going to do this. Like, keep it up. Like, that's all uh, super important to have. Um, where do you see or like what do you kind of got coming up that's kind of special that you plan on doing? I mean, everything you do is uh, is unique and uh, I love all the ingredients. Like what do you have in store that's uh, kind of coming down in the next year or two that you see that's going to change the restaurant a little bit? Because you don't seem like the type of person that likes to keep the things the same way. You like keeping it fresh and simple and you know what I mean? So that means that there's going to be change that comes eventually. Yeah, we have... Uh, uh a lot of things uh, in our minds uh, between me and my partner. Uh, the most recent thing that is about to happen, we are going to set up our outdoor dining, and we have every weekend uh, for the, the whole summer, basically, uh, schedule with live entertainment, uh, which is a nice thing. And uh, I got to invite you to our comedy show, man. He, yeah. He, you got to come to our comedy show. We're doing one before uh, Mother's Day um, on Saturday. It's it's gonna be a nice one. Um, then, in the next year or two, uh, I do have uh, a lot of thoughts that I would like to put in place. Um, one will include uh, a trip to Italy for culinary experience reasons and uh, live Instagrams, uh, IGTVs, and all that cooking with locals and finding nice recipes and this and that. That's going to be my next recipe development uh, kind of focus. You know, go, find it, make it, and then serve it to your, uh, you know, customers. Uh, we have, you know, Music Fest coming up. Uh, we will be participating. We'll be doing something really, really unique at Music Fest. Um, and I'm going to show you after we wrap this up, and you're going to love it. Uh, and I'm sure you're gonna be there on that booth because that's gonna be the busiest booth. Well, that's what I was gonna ask. Is if you like, because uh, you brought everything down here, and I mean, you you have everything to do it down here. Like you had it set up. I mean, do do you do pop ups and uh, booths and like kind of do because you're doing the outside seating? But uh, you know, like what would you do for Music Fest? Is this the first time you're doing it, or have you done stuff with Music Fest before? You don't have to say what you're doing, but I'm saying as far as like uh, setting have, up a kitchen. I you know have what no I mean? No problem saying what I'm gonna do. Uh, Actually, we entered the Music Fest last year for the first time, but Music Fest didn't happen. <laughs> uh, so That's right. I forgot. They tried to do, like, virtual stuff. and Yeah, and they did. They had, like, six or seven vendors, I think, and they had, like, their, you know, their oldest, like, you know, and biggest uh, vendors there. Uh, but, uh, you know, it wasn't like before. I don't think this year is going to be like before either. Maybe as of next summer or the summer after the next summer. Uh, but, uh yeah, we'll be uh, we'll be doing pasta. We've been doing pasta, but we'll do it in a fashionable way. You you will see some footage of what I'm gonna be using to cook, um, and it's pretty unique what we're gonna be doing. Uh, but yeah, in uh, general, like uh, I can do pop ups. I can uh, 
I can go into like venues, use their kitchen and cook. Um, we can bring our equipment and cook. I mean, the only thing that I cannot do is a pizza yet. But uh, we're looking into, you know, maybe investing in a pizza truck because that's becoming a trend. I mean, I've heard of so many weddings actually being catered by pizza trucks. Yeah. <laughs> Things are changing, I guess, you know. No more uh, white cloth, you know. Yeah, a buddy of mine uh, who's done the show a couple times and he comes up, um, he does. Uh, he works with a company that has a mobile pull-behind brick oven pizza. And he's like, it's it's heavy. And he's like, it takes a lot to get it here. But he talks about bringing it up and putting it out front. But the fact that you even have the ability to do stuff like that, and then there's a market for stuff like that. But then if the more you think about it, it's like, you know, if you were able to do that at Music Fest or Bacon Fest or like you started being able to do these festivals, it's a way to get especially at Bethlehem where it's like if something's going on and it would maybe slow down what's coming through the door, you would be able to be a part of it and then, you know, ram your sales up for the weekend and then put, you know, your awesome food into so many different people. Yeah, uh, I consider Music Fest to be uh, one of my biggest marketing type of exposures and I was really, really anxious about it last year. But then, you know, with the pandemic hitting us, I was like, oh, my God, my plans are destroyed. So Yeah, I mean, it's genius to do that and to, and to pull it off because you figure even if the amount of people that are from Bethlehem and then if they're people that, like, haven't really gotten into your food or, like, you know what I mean, or they, they, they're into the pizza but because your pasta is outstanding. We didn't even really get into the pasta dishes that much, but they're extremely impressive as well. But if you were able to give pizza or, po- you know, if you were able to give pasta dishes out down there, like, yeah, that's a lot of people that are going to be like, damn, man, we need to start going to Pat's. I mean, it's genius on your part to even think of doing that. Yeah, we'll be actually cooking it like right in front of them. <laughs> yeah. you, you'll, you'll see. You'll, I'll show you later on. It's no. not a secret. I mean, I, uh, you know, that's what I'm going to be doing at Music Fest. I'm going to be doing pasta. And uh, I don't think there is any other place doing pasta during Music Fest other than uh, the Thai place, the Thai noodles. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'll be doing something different. That's awesome, man. Um I want to thank you for coming on. I know you got a busy day. Uh, we can do as many of these as you want. Anytime you ever want to promote anything. Um, I loved the cooking segment, and it was awesome to work with you. And uh, if you guys ever want to do anything like that or you have a dish, you want to come down and use the space and then come on here to promote it, uh, feel free to do it. When we're in the new space, it will kind of be a better version of uh, what we are trying to do here just because we'll have a kitchen to work out of. Um I want to thank George for introducing us. Uh, he's such a good dude. And, uh, you know, like I said, um, your food, I was impressed by it. it I, I didn't know what to expect from it. Um, I usually go into food completely open-minded. And then when I you brought out everything, I was just, it wasn't one thing was awesome. All the dishes were awesome. And, uh, you know, like I said, I haven't been... You know, as anyone who brings it up or we start talking about stuff, I mention that now. And, you know, and it's like I'm I'm here and I, I didn't know you guys were there, to be honest. And it's like now it's like, holy shit. And then seeing you guys going to Music Fest, like that'd be a game changer to just have that many local people trying your stuff. Uh, I'm glad you're in the area. I'm glad you care about food. Uh, there's a lot of people who don't. So uh, the door is always open to uh, work with me and I'd love to get into more projects. Um, I'm going to give you a second to kind of. Uh, promote anything you want as far as your social media, what's coming up, what what things are going to come out of the way, the new things you're coming down, and uh, just give you a chance to kind of promote. So, yeah, we're on Facebook and Instagram. Um, we, uh, we do a lot of postings on a daily basis. We'll be happy to work with anyone local. Um, we do a lot of community work, and we'll be happy to help out anyone that is in any kind of need, uh, not looking to you know, monetize out of it, like just to help. Um, you know, follow us on our social media, order online directly through us, not through those third party platforms because they take a lot of money uh, out of our cities and out of our pockets and they don't employ people around us. I'm very against that. We need to talk about that one day. Yeah. You need to bring people in here with restaurants and we need to talk about that. That would be a good podcast. Yeah, I'm in, man. Um, so, yeah, patsbistro.com, patsbethlehem.com. We have two websites. One is, like, you know, the one that includes all the location, and the patsbethlehem.com is ours. Uh, recently uh, done, and, uh, you know, this podca- podcast uh, segment will be there whenever you're done with it. Um, just follow us on social media for, uh, you know, 
fun things to happen. Awesome. I'm going to have everything uh, tagged in this post um, so you can scroll down if you're watching YouTube and all the links will be there. If you're a first time listener to the show or watching for the first time, you can go to neveragainstudio.com. That has everything Never Again from apparel to things we offer for small businesses. Uh, I can get you anything that you see that I'm doing. Uh, it's kind of a network I've built. Uh, check out the sponsors. Uh, you know, if you need a plumber, you hit up All Valley. If you need something done with your car, you hit up Rips. Those guys pay for the lights to be on at this place, and I would appreciate if you would also support them. Um, thanks again for coming on. I'm excited to get into more food projects, man. I love, I love that you came down and cooked today. Like that, it's Anytime. cool. You know, when this gets leveled up, I pay attention to it, and that leveled this up. I've been wanting to do food for a while. Where this podcast is going, we're going to be doing cooking segments and all that. And the fact that you like wanted to do that and we teamed up, like it was cool that it was pushed to do to do more, man. Uh, thanks again. Anytime.